Please hold the line. We will answer your call as soon as possible. I'm Michael Schneider, founder and CEO of Service. Today on Please Hold, we have Jamie Simonoff, who is the founder, CEO, and chief inventor at Ring. Jamie, it's great to have you here. Thanks for coming. Ring is an amazing company that builds a smart doorbell that is actually reducing crime in the world in some areas up to 50%. I mean, there's still a couple of crimes that are happening uh, in America, but we actually have, amazingly, I mean, we did prove in a, in a with the Los Angeles Police Department, uh, we actually proved that we were able to reduce crime in an area by 55%. Wow. By having 10% of the homes with Ring in it. Um, so that was, that was, I mean, we have actually done some real impact against crime in neighborhoods. We're not widely enough yet to be uh, taking down crime in the entire United States, but I bet you, I wouldn't be surprised in a year or two if we actually are able to affect crime stats nationally. That's, that's amazing. And so this is all from a smart doorbell. Yeah. Okay. Which is, yeah, no, and I, I, uh, I mean, the best part about this business is for the first three years, people literally laughed when I told them what I did. Why did they laugh? I mean, it's a doorbell. I mean, it's, it's yeah, but it's a, a smart doorbell. I, it is. Uh, but I don't think anyone understood what a smart doorbell could do. I think okay. they just thought of it as like a toy, a joke, um, which is part of our success is because no one saw it. Is it akin to, I mean, people used to think 40 years ago, the phone was fine. Why do you need to innovate on the phone? So the doorbell, you push yeah. it, it rings. Why do you need to innovate on that? Is it, are there parallels there? Is the doorbell and other things in our home going to become really smart? I think, um, so for the, for the parallels, I think it's to, there's lots of businesses that people laugh at. GoPro early on, you know, people are like, oh, a sports action camera, that'll be big. You know, yeah, I mean, it's like a $3 billion company. Like it's pretty good. Like I'd take one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think a lot of people laugh at stuff early on when they can't see what it's going to do. And then when they, once they cause the disruption, it's too hard to catch up, which is why like a GoPro can like break out in a market. How um, did that ever discourage you? Uh, I wouldn't say it discouraged me. I certainly wouldn't say it was a positive thing at the time. I mean, when you're like, when you're in the weeds and not making money and going broke and people are laughing at you at the same time, it's, it is, I'd say it's a, it's a, it's a downer. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we, we always had this mission to reduce crime in neighborhoods. We thought it could do more um, than what anyone else thought. And so we were very, very focused as a company uh, to do that. And so I think that was kind of what kept us going. Um, and then as we started to get more results back, when people laughed at us, it was like kind of like, then it was actually kind of, a, it was like energy, you know, it was like a Red Bull. Um, and now it's funny when someone hasn't heard of us, and I'll say, I make doorbells called Ring or whatever, like doorbells. And I'm like, okay. Like, just reel them in, like, because now it's, now I got some stats. Now it feels good when people laugh at you because you oh, can now actually it's show really them that, yeah. a yeah. very solid business. There's actually, I mean, if you want, there's a great, so I'm at this event in Silicon Valley. This is right before we kind of really broke out as a company. Um, and it's like 50 people in the room. And this woman is up there and she was the CMO of Beats. So she's like, a you know, great pedigree, like, you know, like a, like a, you know, like someone you look up to. And mm -hmm. then she does a whole talk, a keynote thing questions and answers and I asked her a question about something with like marketing about something like not specifically I didn't say like how do you market a doorbell and she said what do you do and I said I make this smart doorbell called ring and she said doorbell I said yeah but you can like see and talk from the phone she goes doorbell I said yeah she goes you're done anyway wow and then as if the world didn't need doorbells anymore just it was like a quick off the cuff like just you're like you know it was kind of funny everyone laughed yeah. like I was like ah, like you know like she then ended up getting an investment from uh, the uh, venture capital firm that, that I'm in also and got introduced to me not knowing who I was <laughs> and came to the office here. And when she came up, I'm like, do you remember who I am? And she's like, oh my God. And you're like, let me, I'm like, let me show you through the office. <laughs> and so I've actually become very good friends with her. Really nice. Uh, but, you know, but like that's one of those like ones where like, you know, what a great moment. It, it's fun. Like that, and that's like, you know, I mean, like, that's also part of, you know, success is it is really hard. And I don't think you're supposed to have people cheerleading for you. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like it, it's what we're doing is hard and, and that's, that's part of it. And so we got to go out there and, and lead and do it. And then when you have a little bit of it, it's kind of nice to people that kind of maybe did that to just show them a little bit of, you know, what you're able to do. Big middle finger. It's like a, it's like a, it's like a middle, middle finger, like a middle okay. size. Like, All right. Like half size middle not, finger. Not big yet. So your past is a lot in telecom. Yeah. And I'm curious, I mean, you were doing stuff way early on, like transcribing voicemails yeah. and doing stuff ahead of its time. 
Why didn't you stay in the telecom space? You seemed like you knew that really well. You had had some success. So I actually did it. So we run one of the largest video telecom networks in the country now. Um, Ring does. That's what Ring is. I mean, Ring okay. is a, I mean, that's the funny thing. Like it, it, it's, I actually thought I was escaping telecom coming here. Uh, we use SIP, which is the uh, protocol for basically voice for voice over IP mm -hmm. uh, to talk from the Ring to the, the central servers. Um, Basically, the Ring is a end device phone. It's got two-way audio, one-way video. Goes to a conference, basically, server that we've had to build in the cloud so that multiple people can come off of it and talk at the same time. And so we actually, it's funny, we actually did build, in essence, a very large, in fact, it's probably the largest telecom network I've ever had now. Wow. Did um, you see it that way from the beginning or it evolved into that? Not at all. Okay. I mean, the beginning was really, I couldn't hear my doorbell and built a doorbell that would allow me to listen to it in my garage. The, so, yeah, the exact... I mean, that's... So, yeah, no, no telecom, big plans, nothing. It was literally... I just needed a doorbell that I could see in my garage. Um, the, the thing I read a line was you were trying to invent whatever was coming next for you in your garage, and you kept getting interrupted by the doorbell. So is that, no, it's actually, so it's funny, it's actually the, kind of the opposite. You couldn't hear the doorbell. I couldn't hear the doorbell. The doorbell. Okay. And so we'd have, like, an investor come over, to show them what I was trying to build. It was like this little gardening startup thing, this other little thing. And I wouldn't hear them, and my phone didn't work in the garage. Didn't have any signal. So I was like, I gotta do something to fix this. So I literally like hacked up like a drop cam with a button and like this whole thing and like put it on, it's like a huge thing, like put it on my door. How ugly was the very first one? It's over my, it's really ugly. Yeah. I mean, it is like, in fact, it's, what's crazy is we put that for sale December of 2012. So that's four years ago. And, that and it was thing called actually, Doorbot at the time? It was Doorbot. And yeah. I mean, it was like, it was like this. It had like four AA batteries or eight AA batteries that went into it. I mean, it was insane. It was like the fact that only four years ago, that's what we put out there. And it sold. I mean, we sold over a million dollars of the pre-sale of that product. We actually mm -hmm. had already versioned it before we shipped it. We actually ended up versioning it down. But it, it sold. That ugly version sold a million dollars worth uh, on pre-sale before we even showed the newer version, which was still Doorbot, and then, the, I mean, so. Tell me about the evolution of hardware, because I can imagine, I'm, I've always done stuff in software. Yeah. And software is really easy, because if I see something I want to fix, I push a fix code it. fix, yeah. and I fix it. You can't do that. How frustrating is that? Yeah, it's, it is definitely, I mean, it is beyond, I mean, it's beyond frustrating, because you get people that say, like, oh, you know, there's this issue on the thing that does this, and you should fix it. And I'm like, I know. You know, and they're like, it's like almost like they don't think I care. But the problem with it is even like, even on the software side of hardware. So mm -hmm. most of luckily, most of the things that happen on our device are software, but on hardware. You can't push firmware to hardware without doing extensive testing. Because if you brick it, you can't get it back. So when, when we're dealing with cloud stuff, which I also came from the cloud side, mm -hmm. great, roll up the thing. And if it crashes, roll it back. You'll be down for two minutes on one server and flip it over to the other server. It doesn't, like, nothing, there's really no harm in that. So you can do a lot less QA and kind of have it going. Right. Um, you know, with us, it's probably really fixing a non, like, hot fix problem. So something that's, like, not, if something's obviously causing a trouble on the network, like, we will get it rolled out in, in hours or days if we have to. I'd say, like, a normal sort of just slight bug that's happening somewhere is probably three months. Wow. Three months of just of QA and From testing. From like time that it's identified to to actually roll to the end unit. Because you have like, you know, your your software time of getting it, you know, put in is probably like a couple of weeks. Your QA time is over over a month because you do internal QA, then you do like external QA, then you do like a beta re release. And then even when you roll it out, you roll it out and like you start small and sort of work your way up. There has been there have been companies that are out there that literally rolled out full firmware releases um, and bricked every single unit. It happened to me on my last iPhone, and I actually emailed Tim Cook about it, and I got a response. Who no knows way. Tim personally, because I was so pissed off because Apple released I don't remember what it was iOS something. Yeah. And I updated, and I don't remember the exact problem. I think it was the phone could not get a Wi-Fi or a cell signal no matter what you did. Something crazy yeah. like that. And it took them a couple days to like figure it out and release a hot fix. And I just wrote him and I'm like, I've lost six hours of my day. I'm missing phone calls. Like my phone literally wouldn't work. And I got an apology, which felt good. But, so, but yeah, there, are, there are very high profile examples, even companies like Apple with all the money in the world. What's happening to Samsung right now? 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just, you, you, and that's, you know, hardware is, I mean, it's like everyone kind of says it, and it's like this, like, you know, hardware is hard. Like, it is. It really, it really is hard. I, though, do, I do believe that, that life um, is very balanced. Like, there's an organic balance to life, and you can, there's like, the, whether it's the Chinese proverbs or like, Feng Shui or, you know, like yin and yang, but like there's always this balance. So it is, hardware is harder as a business to like to do, Mm -hmm. but it's much easier to get revenue in hardware. Whereas software is easier to like, you can roll out a software business, like a cloud business in days, but to get to the like revenue levels we're at is really, really hard. And that's because people feel like they're buying a physical product and it just it's there's an a, easier there sell. is a embedded distribution model to sell your good mm-hmm. out there. It's you know Amazon, it's stores, it's all that stuff. Now again, they're not easy to get into, but it's easier to do that than I have this cloud service. I just want to sell it. Yep. You know Best Buy doesn't carry cloud services. People don't walk in and buy them. Uh, you know on the shelf. Yep. And so there is with hardware, there is something you know as humans, it's much easier to buy something you can see and touch than to rent something on the cloud. Um, Entrepreneurs typically are very impatient and like to move really fast. So has that been an adjustment for you? Like you can't just release a new model or release a hotfix or have you adjusted to that well? Well, I don't adjust. I, I'm, so no, I'm like a pretty angry person okay. overall. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and I think that's why I've done well in hardware is I, I don't adjust. I still, I still to this day run at that speed uh, against it, and so I think mm-hmm. we, we because of that we end up doing things better and faster. Um, I you know I believe hardware is a very tough business. It's a low margin business in the end. Like you know you, you know in the end everyone becomes you know an Apple or Samsung where it's just very high volume, mm-hmm. lower margins. It's not software margins. Through the chain, everyone's just taking a little piece, and it yeah, it becomes it becomes hardware margins even for Apple. I mean, Apple's probably the number one in terms of like keeping margin. It's not software. Yeah. Um, and so it's a tough business. It's a fight out business. Like, you're, you know, Apple's fighting with Samsung every day out there, you know, even though they're the world's largest company and they're still fighting like... And Google you know, now with the Pixel. And Google, I mean, look at them coming in and then Amazon. And so mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it is a tough business and I think you have to keep things hard and nimble and tough in that. You, 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 and so I think that's, you don't want to sort of lay back and say, yeah, it's hardware. Yep. Else, you know. How many times a week do you get asked about Shark Tank? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's still daily, but, it's, I mean, but, but if it wasn't for Shark Tank, we wouldn't even be here. So I wanted to ask you, uh, Kevin O'Leary, his nickname is Mr. Wonderful, right? Yeah. Gave you a $700,000 offer. It was kind of a crazy offer. It was a loan, but yep. you know, he'd recoup it, and then there was an equity piece, and then he got royalties forever and all this stuff. And, you, and did you go on Shark Tank for publicity, or you actually needed the money? We were broke. You were broke. We were dead broke when we went on Shark Tank. So I actually, I really thought we were going to get a deal. I was hoping with Cuban. Okay. Um, I actually thought we'd get a deal with Cuban. Like I thought we'd get the deal and we'd do it and it'd be great and we'd like have money again. Mm-hmm. And I was actually shocked when we didn't get it. Um, I, it was close to the end of the company. Um, so you literally were a desperate entrepreneur oh, no, pitching these people in front of cameras being like, like I need like, to save my company. And now they're like, you're such a good actor on that. And I'm like, <laughs> no, like I was just fucking <laughs> desperate. Like I literally was out of fucking money. Like, wow. Like, did you consider the seven hundred thousand dollar offer? I standing up there, yeah. I mean, I was thinking like it actually was one of those like where I'm like, this is this is basically death either way. Mm-hmm. Like I'll rather die a proud man than a than a <laughs> than, a, than a, a man that took a loan. But like, I mean, it was the truth is though, Mister Wonderful actually is probably the nicest person on that show, um, and I don't want to like break his uh, like you know his persona, his persona because now everybody. But the way the show works is you you film the show. And only about 50% of people that film air. So not everyone even that goes through that whole process gets on the TV. The biggest thing for them as a show is having someone go through that, that stress of getting the offer and accepting or not accepting. They love that ending. And because no one else had given us an offer, if he hadn't done that, we probably would not have been on air. Mm. He knew we weren't going to take it. Um, and so it actually is like, he, it's kind of like a... Like, so he helped you? 100% he did. Yeah. Um, and that, and he's made himself this character that like, that's his thing that he's like this jerk that does this. But in reality, he's actually helping people like me who would not have probably gone on otherwise. And that he felt probably deserved to be on. Was Branson a tougher negotiator than O'Leary? Branson's interesting. Branson was not 
so Branson's not a negotiator at all. Okay. Um, he is when he likes something, he just likes something. He's he's a he's a true human being. Um, in fact, I say he's not a business person. Um, I think Richard he, Branson, who's founded hundreds of businesses, is not a business person. Yes. Why? Because to me, a business person is someone who cares about building business. He cares about doing things. Like he loves trains, so he has trains. He loves planes, so he has planes. Like the reason he was so upset, in my opinion. Uh, about Virgin America is because he loves owning airplanes. Like he loves the business. He likes the people in it. He likes delivering that service. He doesn't really care about, you know, obviously you need to be successful in business to keep doing that stuff. So obviously he cares that it's like, a, it gives him the ability to keep doing it. But if you look at everything he does, he just likes to do stuff. And so like with us, he like loved the idea that we could reduce crime in a neighborhood with a doorbell. And he loved that and he didn't negotiate hard and he didn't try to like, he just said like, I want to be in on this. Let me look at it. And his, they came in and looked at the, the numbers to make sure it's like not, you know, like a fraud. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I mean, it's like, he's just, uh, but he's an amazing, I mean, being able to spend time with him now, he's someone who just is like, he, he's almost like it's, he just loves to learn and to touch and to feel and like work for the world and do things. And again, that to me, that's not a business person. Have you prevented any crime on Necker? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. That. Hopefully, I don't think there's been any. Actually, there's probably been some crimes, but not not the legal ones. Any stray just... dolphins or yeah, anything exactly. else that comes um, I did get to go to Necker, and that was uh, beautiful. That was a pretty amazing, amazing thing. Um. So I want to ask you about customer service, selfishly, because that's yes. what service is doing in the world. Um. I'm curious how you guys navigate it at Ring, having a physical product. And um, are you, you know, Ring isn't that technical, but if you're installing it, oh, it can get a little technical. Devil's in the details. Yeah. How do you, um, how does your team manage that? Do you do customer service in-house? Tell me about sure. your operation. So customer service to us is one of the core pillars of the business. So it's something that we always say, we'll always own 100%. Uh, we'll always do it. Meaning you'll never outsource customer service. Never outsource it. Do you view it as a cost center or as a marketing opportunity? I view it as a core sort of pillar of the business. So I don't view it as either cost or opportunity. I look at it as in order to deliver the experience that we need to deliver to our customer, customer service is the most valuable thing. Like, I mean, there's a certain percentage of people that buy our box, never talk to us, install it, love it, go on with their lives. Mm -hmm. There's obviously a certain percentage that buy the box and have some sort of issues from super light to super difficult with Wi-Fi and things like that, and video and phones, it can actually get pretty hard and technical to figure out like, what is actually happening. Um, you know, in order to like sell to the general market and to do this, like with different age customers and everything else, like we want to have everyone have that experience. And I, you know, a negative review is something like, you know, whatever they say, like 10 or 20 X, what a positive experience is. And so to me, customer service is just too important. So we do it in house. Uh, we always say we do it local to the country. So we used to say we, we used to say U.S. based customer support, but the reality is now we're an international company. Okay. So now, like with launching Europe, we're actually opening a center in Europe to do support there. So really, we want to be local to the environment that we're in. How many languages do you support in? Right now, we're just English and Spanish, but we're launching German and French. Okay. So we'll be kind of a. I mean, for for our market, that's pretty much like that's. Pretty How. Broad. How easy is it for somebody to get in touch with a human? You know, you so, have these businesses that make you read the frequently asked questions and go through hoops. Sure. Do you guys make them go through hoops? So first of all, my email address is on every box. Your personal email my address personal is on every box? My personal email address is on every single box. Do you answer your own email? I do. How many emails do you get a day? You know, on this, I, I'd say I get probably, depending on the day, two to ten emails from customers that are upset about something. It, they're always upset, right? They're never saying, I love the product? No, I, I'd probably get, I'd probably get like three or four that love it. Okay. And, and you know, but, I, but again, like, you know, people don't typically take the time to say like, thank you for delivering on what I paid you money to deliver on. Correct. Like you emailed Tim Cook because your iPhone broke. Mm -hmm. You didn't email about all those delightful experiences you've had along the years where like it's been an amazing device. That's That's true. fine, by the way. I, I, I think that's fine. Like, they paid me money. You don't have to thank me after you pay me money to do something. Like, that's expected. So, but yeah, email's on the box. 
from a top level, that means customer service has to be perfect. Wow. Because if it's bad, I can't function as a human. Um, then the next level is we do it here. So that's, you know, and we do it with all of our own people. Here in Santa Monica or uh, here so in the US? We, we used to do it here in Santa Monica. We couldn't actually hire fast enough. It's now in Phoenix. Okay. Um, we have about 300 people in customer service today. Um, our call answer hold time is 41 seconds right now. Zero is our goal. Okay. So, um, so anything we, above like 30 actually starts to set alerts off in the center. That's great. And, and 30, as you know, from a customer service side, I'd say most people target 5 to 10 as success. Mm -hmm. um, do you think your email will be on the box forever? Yes. Okay. 100%. If you guys 10x, if you 100x, your email's on the box. Yeah. I, at some point, what I'll probably have to do, though, is have some sort of a team, especially when you have an issue. Like you said, like, you know, there was an issue on an iPhone update. You know, you can't, like, if there's an issue, you can't respond to 10,000 emails. So mm -hmm. you need to have some sort of a team in place to sort of help with that. Having that email, though, on there and getting that direct feedback, it makes it so that no one can fool me on what's actually happening in the business. Um, so I hear everything. I see everything. I know when stuff's trending. A lot of times, I'll be the first person to raise a flag and say, like, what's this bug going on? Like, there is no bug for that. I'm like, no, no. Like Jenny in Orlando, Florida emailed me. I talked to her. There's a freaking bug on this thing. And, you know, because I, so it, it gives you, I, I, I think it's important at the top to have a smell and a taste for your business. Mm -hmm. You can't, you shouldn't know your business. You should actually like sense your business. And this is one of the most important ways of sensing it is to not be told what's happening in the center. It's to actually be part of the center. Feel it. Yeah. Um, so what do you think about bots? Um, there's, bots are all the rage right now. Um, there's people trying to automate the selling of stuff. So e-commerce bots, there's news bots, there's stuff we're working on like customer service bots. Given how important customer service is for a company like Ring, do you ever see yourself automating stuff? So bots sort of are close to the answer. If you take the OT out and put the other two letters together, you now have what a bot is, which is bullshit. <laughs> um, I think bots are cool for certain things. I think they're literally, it's a backwards UI. Um, UI, you know, user interface has made it so that we can use a screen and very quickly get what we need. Mm -hmm. A bot is doing the same thing, but I don't have to type out something to it and then it has to send something back to me so I can read it. So I don't understand why we're going backwards. I like to go forwards. So what do you think? Do you agree with me that the 800 number is a thing of the past or do you think that's a thing of the future? The 800, the actual, I think dialing in on a telecom line with dialing a number, I think is a thing of the past. Okay. So or, what or, or is transitioning. So what is the future? I think talking using video something, you know, either video or having a rich experience where the person can see your app and you're talking to them and you're saying, here's my problem. You know, I'm like, I can't see the video. Can you see it? And they're like, yeah, I can see that. Hold on one second. And fixing it in that way. I think, I think there's still that, I think voice is still going to be a part of the thing. Uh, chat, I do believe is actually great also, because if you're on a train or you're on a bus, like if you're trapped, you know, like if you're in the morning, you're commuting and you want to like get something, you your Fitbit fixed, you know, being able to chat with them on there without talking. Cause a lot of places you can't actually talk. Mm -hmm. um, so I think chat is an important thing. But you wouldn't combine any sort of AI with the chat. You just say chat with a human. I think some of it will, some of it's helpful. I think a lot of times though, what I've seen is it basically just keeps, it keeps pissing customers off even more. Mm -hmm. And they're going to end in the same place. I think doing where you're not as, you're not trying to, a lot of times I think what they're trying to do now with bots is almost fake being a human and then kind of put the human in. I think what's better is like when you log in, it's like, here's our FAQ section for around what you're asking. Mm -hmm. Not trying to be like, I'm not a human saying this, check it out. And I think the FAQ stuff and that the self-discovery, I think is actually a big part of customer service. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I, I to me, I don't think you ever want to tell a customer how they have to get support. Uh, but I do, I, the bot thing, I, don't, I, I think it is Silicon Valley hype right now. I, I, don't, think it's, I don't think it's anywhere near where it has to be to, to, to actually be helpful to people. Yep. Well, I'm still hopeful that my business has a purpose in the world, despite the BS. Um, I'm sorry, I just no, I, can't, no, I, can't, I can't help myself. No, it's totally, I, I agree with you. I think the way most bots have been implemented is not that useful for people. Yeah. Um, frequently asked questions is one of the few areas that I think could be extremely powerful with bots. And yeah, and to me, that's like better search. 
It is better search. Yeah. It's more natural and search that's what, and using yeah, keywords. And so maybe we're like, but like the, the bots thing to me is like what people are trying to go for is that it's actually interacting in a way that's sort of very fluid. And I think that can end up pissing customers off because it's, they kind of feel all of a sudden like this isn't right. In the beginning, we didn't tell them it was a bot in our app. And we would get everything from, wow, you're typing so fast. You were impressed. <laughs> you slow down. Yeah. To, fuck you, you're a, you're a bot. You're not a person. <laughs> and like, and when, when the person said, fuck you, the bot would be like, okay, can I please have your email address to get the receipt or whatever? And yeah. like, they would just lose it. Yeah, yeah. And we started getting negative app reviews because yeah. people felt like we were duping them. That's Now in the beginning, we say, Hi, this I'm is the a... helpful bot and yeah, I'm going to yeah. gather some information and pass it to a human. And actually people... I think appreciate that honesty. And to me, that's like what IVR, you know, the interactive voice yeah. response kind of has done in the past. And that's a something people are used to. And it, it's, you know, I think that's actually been a positive thing. And again, like if you do that and then you say, oh, like I see you have a problem with whatever, there's actually an issue right now and it'll be resolved in an hour. Mm -hmm. Like great use of a bot. Yeah. Like great use of a way of like kind of parsing that out and then giving a response. I want to ask you about distribution. Do you think it's possible to make something physical and not go through big box retail and build a big business? Could you go direct and make Ring huge? Um, you know, big box retail still for the general market, there is still a, it's, it's a great way of getting to the general market. Um, I mean, even if you look, Amazon is selling Echo in big box. So here you have like, the answer to the end of big box Amazon, you know, like this, like literally like the e-commerce company. Aren't they also opening physical stores? In some also open physical stores. Yeah. There's something about physical, 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 right? Like, I mean, like people being able to go in and see ring and a Best Buy or a Home Depot or a Lowe's, like there, there's something about that. That's nice to get to see it and feel it and, and buy it. Um, I think like specialized wise though, like I, I definitely think there are online only ways of doing, uh, to do uh, physical goods that are huge. I mean, if you look in China, um, what is it, Zhao, um, it's not Huawei, it's the other one, it's Xiaomin, or whatever, that, that phone. I mean, it's a multi-billion dollar company, they only sell direct. Okay, interesting. Um, so there's, there's, so I think, I, I think, I, I definitely think there is, and I probably, we'll, we'll probably see more of it in the future that will happen like that. Um, you know, I, I, but for right now, for us, our mission is around, again, reducing crime in neighborhoods. That means we want to get out to the general public. So it's not about building the highest margin business ever created. It's not about kind of making scarcity. It's like we will be everywhere. We, we're not, we don't care about that side of things. We want to be widely distributed. Another question about the crime prevention. So, um, well, first of all, what's the craziest thing you guys have seen on camera? I mean, we, we had a, I mean we've had a, a customer that was uh, at gunpoint. Um, and we caught the person who did it. So someone robbed a customer in front of their house as they were coming into the door. It's actually a student in Texas. Wow. And at gunpoint, I mean, that was pretty scary. That's about as scary, that's about as scary as what we've seen. Yeah. And then we've seen stuff from like the funny side of literally like a bear, like knocking on the store that people are like screaming through the, the ring, like, go away, you know, it's like, go away bear. I mean, like, so there's been some funny stuff. A lot of criminals that come up to empty houses where the person answers and scares them away. So that's the is that the prevention. core crime prevention? You you push the bell it's, and you feel like someone's home? It's presence. Okay. Yeah, by delivering presence. So the, one of the reasons why crime has risen in our neighborhoods is because presence is gone now. Like, you know, you have both family members working, you know, kids are off at school and have after school activities. So like the neighborhood is actually very empty during the day. Mm -hmm. And with that, like empty houses are what criminals go after. So by delivering presence back into the neighborhood, it just makes it so, even if it's not every house, but someone going around and having someone talk to them and say, hey, can I help you? It, you, you basically move the crime out of those areas. Is the ring always recording? Uh, ring records for motion detection uh, or doorbell ding. So we don't okay. always record that. Okay. Um, and so is it standard now to turn over your ring footage to the police if you've had an incident? So most of the time, and we do get some requests, most of the time the customer, obviously, it's the customer can just do it their themselves. interest, right? Yeah. They want to turn it over. Uh, I think we've had two murders, actually, of ring that happened to ring customers where wow. the police asked for the footage from the ring. Um, which again, when you, it, it, one of the crazy things when you have like a big enough number of anything is you see everything. Like, like, you know, if the percentage of murder rate is 
you know, one in one million, okay, well, then we'll see some murder. Like, it's, mm -hmm. it is kind of crazy, like, the stuff that you actually see when you get big. Um, it's kind of everything. How many rings have you sold? I sold a lot. <laughs> You're not really seeing a number. Yeah, we don't really see a number, but okay. it is a lot. Not as, many, not as many as Big Macs yet. As, uh, big Macs. Which one do you mean? Or not Big Macs. Um, it is Big Macs when McDonald's used to put. Uh, oh, big. Oh, sorry. Big Macs. No, they're, like, they're like, yeah, 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 no, no, no. I don't think we'll ever catch the Big Mac. Sorry. <laughs> What's next for Ring? You've got the smart doorbell. You have a few different products today, right? Yeah. So we build, I mean, we're a simple company. We build around three rings of security the ring of security on your front door, mm -hmm. which we always view as the most important place to start in the home in the neighborhood because that's where everything happens. A, a, a burglar is going to go to your front door and see if you're home. Even if they don't ring the actual doorbell, they're going to check, look around. That's where they start. Then the ring of security around your home, which is our like stick up cameras and other cameras for the outside of your house, the ring of security around your house. Then we take the data from that and the ring of security around your neighborhood and linking all these up. So we're now in neighborhoods where we actually have very high percentages of penetration in neighborhoods. So you're the future of neighborhood watch. Yeah. Yeah. So hundred percent. Are you going to do things like letting me unlock my door? You know, uh, the interesting thing is, yes, because we partner with people on that, but no, probably not from a direct side. It doesn't really fit with what we're doing. Okay. Um, definitely much more of a convenience thing, the door lock. Um, and so we have, we've partnered with a ton of door lock companies so that you can unlock and lock the door from the app. Mm -hmm. um, not a super highly used feature, but it's definitely convenient. I think it'll, it'll be something people will use more and more in the future. So your core focus is preventing crime and not necessarily convenience. I mean, Ring is convenient, but you want to change the yeah, world we, by we, running crime. Yeah, we love, I mean, like, we like when someone uses it for convenience, like that's great, but as a $200 device, the truth is, for a lot of people, I mean, that is not, it's not just like an afterthought, it's like just having it for convenience is not something you can just, oh, I'll buy the $200 doorbell. Um, you know, we think that, you know, it, from that side, that's one side, and the other side is, you know, as a company, we want to do something a little bit more than just make a fun device. Um, we like the fact that we're making an impact uh, in what we do, and so that's something that, you know, as a business, as a team, it's something we've all kind of gotten around and, and want to accomplish. That's great. Well, I think you're improving the world. Trying to. Thanks so much for being on today. Hey, thanks a lot. Yeah. Did you like what you just saw? You want to see more? Go ahead and subscribe. We have new episodes every Tuesday, and if there's someone you want to see on the show, just add them as a comment down below. We'll take a look, and we'll have them on if we can. Thanks again.